Dr. Gordon Lithgow is a professor and vice president of academic affairs at the Buck Institute. Dr. Lithgow's research focuses on uncovering genes and small molecules that prolong lifespan for enhanced molecular stability. He has been recognized with the Glenn Award for Research in Biological Mechanisms of Aging and the Tanovis Award for Biomedical Research. Uh, Dr. Lithgow, uh, welcome to Modern Healthspan and thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, it's my pleasure. So, Dr. Lithgow, you have been at the Buck since, is it 2000? It was... Oh boy, you would bring that up, huh? Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> it's a long years, time. 21 years. <laughs> So, and so you have been studying aging for twenty, for for that time. So, can you tell me? So, what led you to start studying with aging? Uh, well, actually, I was a postdoc in the in the mid nineties, and uh, I was working for a pharmaceutical company at the time, and and really wasn't satisfied with the sort of uh, de- degree to which people were asking important questions. And to be honest, I just came across a paper, one of those things you used to do in, in libraries when we had libraries with real <laughs> books and print and yeah. paper. And uh, I came across a, a publication from Tom Johnson, University of Colorado. I really didn't understand it. It was in, in science. And uh, I had to read it three or four times, but, but I eventually grasped that what Tom had done was to discover an aging gene, a mutation mm-hmm. in a, a tiny nematode worm, C. elegans, that greatly increased its lifespan by 70, 70%, 70%. And it was just one of those things where you thought, that's, that's unbelievable. I don't know anything about aging or lifespan, um, but I do know about genetics. And I knew that if you could find mutations in a biological process, then mm. there was a chance to really find out what was going on. And, you know, it made me think of development and the, the you know, the discoveries of major regulators of development through mm. genetics and simple organisms. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a starting pistol. Uh, that, this, this, is, this is going to be an avalanche of people interested in trying to understand aging through genetics mm. in, in really simple animals. So it really was the influence of a single paper. Mm. Uh, amazing. And also, I guess you, you were very early in the field. I, I don't think the avalanche happened that quickly. <laughs> No, no, it took it took a while. Actually, I, I I was one of the naive ones who who thought this this paper was, um, you know, an incredible step forward. And and but many people didn't believe it. Uh, many right. researchers thought that this could not be possible. That you would have a, a mutation in a single gene that mm. would lead to such a, a, a drastic increase in 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 lifespan in, in life history. And what Tom was actually showing in that science paper was it slowed aging throughout life. And um, so, but I, I Tom joined Tom's lab as they did some other possibly naive people at that time. <laughs> um, but it was a great period because during the time that we were in Colorado, um, other major, major figures came into the aging field, Cynthia Kenyon, Gary Rufkin. And, and Cynthia, for one, you know, was discovering her own aging genes. And then, mm. and then there was a sense that, wow, this is real. You know, this is really going to be an explosion of um, a, a new field of biology, essentially. Right. And we do seem to be getting there now, I must admit. It, it seems finally. But I guess you just saw it so much earlier. So that was. Yeah, as I say, probably naivety. But uh, but yeah, lucky and fortunate to be in, in the right place at the right time and, and see that happen. And of course, it was happening in other areas as well, like cellular senescence. Uh, mm. So it wasn't just happening in nematodes and eventually, you know, yeast as well. Um, but but it, but various different approaches to aging mm. were making incredible progress in a short period of time in the in the late 90s and early mm. 2000s. And, you know, this went from being, I, I believe, a somewhat disregarded uh, off, off the beaten track area of biology. And, and, and suddenly young people coming out of their PhDs were, were, were wanted to do the biology of aging because, they were seeing these papers appear in, in nature and science every couple of weeks that were new aging genes and new aging mechanisms. So it, yeah, it was e- extremely exciting and it's, it's been fantastic to see the progress uh, over 20, 23, 24 years. Um, we now have an encyclopedic you know, knowledge of aging mechanisms in, in different aging systems. So it's been great. Right. Yes. Yeah. There's been a lot of progress. Uh, so, Sticking with that kind of the, the overview, type, so why do you think we age? I mean, from a, I guess, evolutionarily and to some degree, I guess that feeds down into the me- mechanism. But what is the purpose of aging? 
Yeah, it's a it's terrific question. And I think it's a question we're going to still be talking about in 20 years time. I mean, mm-hmm. I think if, if you talk to the evolutionary biologists who have thought about this deeply, um, they would probably answer that there is no purpose to aging. Uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's purpose to growth. There's purpose to reproduction. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything that involves getting your genes into the next generation has purpose in, in, in through the lens of Darwinian natural selection, evolutionary biology. Um, aging doesn't have that in a, in a sense that it's, it really hasn't been shown um, categorically that there's an, an advantage to aging. This goes back to the profound mystery, right? You've got mm-hmm. Darwinian natural selection um, perfecting mechanisms unique to particular environments that promote genes or alleles going to the next generation. Uh, and, and then you step back and you look at aging and you think, well, 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 why would aging contribute to that? You know, mm. why, why, why are the wrinkles around your eyes contributing to your genes going into the next generation? You know, why does Alzheimer's uh, improve your chances of your genes going into the next generation? Doesn't make sense. And the evolutionary biologists have basically said to the rest of us, people, geneticists like myself, that you know, think about think about aging as a maladaptive process. Really, what's going on is that we're selecting for genes that promote early life phenotypes, mm. early life effects, growth and reproduction spring to mind, obviously. It, basically, anything that gets you in your genes into the next generation is going to be promoted. Mm-hmm. And in that model, aging is completely unimportant. Natural mm. selection doesn't see aging. Aging is quite rare in the wild, actually. Most, mm. you know, most organisms, you know, think about a lab mouse lives for two or three years in the lab. It's doubtful if it lives for any more than two or three months in the wild. So in the wild, aging doesn't exist. And, and, and so, so aging is really a sort of epiphenomena of nature doing its thing of selecting for advantages early in life. And we can go into, you know, why are there long-lived animals, why are there short-lived animals and so on. But, but going back to your question, what's the purpose of aging? I think the weight of evidence right now says zero no purpose whatsoever and I, as i say i think we'll be debating this 20 30 years from now but that, that's where i would stand right now okay excellent thank you interesting yeah it, it would i would love to talk about that for but i i think we should move it <laughs> because you're right we, we could spend the whole hour talking about that um so do you so we have some methods. We know there's some methods of extending lifespan right now. Uh, there's some uh, chemicals and there's, we eat the right thing or we do exercise. Do you think that humans with this kind of intervention can get beyond 120, which seems to be about the limit right now, 115. Um, so do, do you think there's a way of getting beyond that? I mean, I'm a pretty conservative scientist. I characterize myself as, and but I would absolutely say yes to that. Hmm. Um, First of all, because we know that people can live to, you know, 115, 118, 120 already. Very, extremely rare individuals. We have to make mm. that clear. These are extremely rare people. Um, but it shows it's possible. Mm-hmm. And also what we're seeing in laboratory animals suggests that we can at least move the needle. And, and of course, most of human progress in terms of life expectancy is not about technological, you know, anti-aging innovations. It's about... Um, things like preventing childhood uh, death and uh, antibiotics and vaccines and everything else. We know that that history of life expectancy is increasing. Um, but I, 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 and some of my colleagues disagree, and, and this is partly to do with the, the, how complex humans are. I mean, you're so, we're so complex. How do we really change this? But I, I put, I put my faith in what I, I see in laboratory animals and think, well, well, why shouldn't we ask that question? Why shouldn't we? go forward and ask whether we can get an, a mean lifespan, even a, even a, well, certainly a mean lifespan of something like a hundred would be phenomenal. Mm. And, and of course the caveat to that is it has to be healthy. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, it's like uh, near Basel, I said, it's like we're trying to extend health span and then longevity comes as a nice side effect. I mean, that, that, I think that's right. And I think that's a, I think that's a good way to think about the field. Um, because it, it, it focuses on it focuses on human suffering and human disease as being the main target of all our activities, and and because we believe that aging is is essentially a cause of that suffering, it's it's appropriate that we focus on aging 
as a target. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, if if we if the contrary would be, well, let's just make everything live longer. And there's significant evidence in the animal literature that you can live longer but not be healthier in some circumstances, in some in- interventions. So so yeah, I completely agree with Nier that what we're trying to do is make people live healthier. And as a consequence, we might look back and go, wow, why are people living so long these days? I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.